Back in April of 2013, I went through something that I haven't been able to talk about. I was paid a significant amount of money to stay quiet in return for signing a 10-year agreement to shut the hell up. Now that the time is up, I've considered my options. I could just let this go and never speak of it again. I won't gain anything from speaking out, and I got a lot to lose. But then again, this is just an anonymous post online. Words have less meaning that way. West Virginia. It was hotter than usual without a whiff of wind. I was coming home from a visit to my aunt. She'd broken her leg and couldn't leave her house. I was making my way back home, taking the I-64 out of Lewisburg. It started with the radio. It was playing that one Macklemore song I'd heard a hundred times over. The sound was cutting in and out in a quick staccato, then disappeared completely. I could hear cars honking up front as a line began to form. There was a sway in the trees, as if greater and greater pressure was being put on them. I could hear wind rushing against the left side of the car, forcing me to pull the other way to compensate. I closed the sunroof as a dust cloud blew past, staining the windshield. Then, a rumble. It sounded like thunder, but from the ground. Like a groaning bellow, growing louder and clearer by the second. As it reached its peak, I could see trees toppling over. A small Kia got pushed off balance and swerved off the road. As the sound died down, the road devolved into chaos. Some were desperately changing lanes, others were stepping on the brakes. I got my door scraped as the car behind me sped past. The radio was playing an automated message. A local emergency alert referred to as a geological event. We were asked to turn off all air conditioning, slow down, and divert to the nearest exit. It repeated in a monotone voice. Geological event. No air conditioning. Slow down. Divert to nearest exit. Minutes passed. There was a line forming further down the road. Police officers blocking the lanes in all directions, leaving a highway exit as the only option. Some folks were trying to push past the barricades, but were forced back at gunpoint. I could see officers wearing gas masks and riot shields. We were waved in. I followed the exit and got directed to the right. There was an open field that was used as a sort of impromptu parking lot. Cars were being waved in and parked in a way that boxed us in, leaving no room for us to open our doors in either direction unless we got parked at the edge. Four lines of cars with about 10-15 vehicles per line. Surplus vehicles were directed further down the road. The place was packed. I got stuck in the second row, about six cars in. Pretty much everyone around me were on their phones. I didn't have anyone to call, but there seemed to be an issue getting a signal through. The radio was still repeating the emergency message. Voices were getting louder. A man, two cars to my left, leaned out of a gap in the door, screaming at the officers to answer his question. They responded immediately with a warning shot, straight into the air. Stay in your vehicle, they screamed. Lock your doors. I'm not telling you again. A couple of folks were filming, but there seemed to be trouble uploading. We were losing bandwidth. It didn't take long until phone signals were completely blocked. I think a video or two of that officer firing into the air made it online. They were patrolling back and forth. We were told to stay in our vehicles. Windows up. Doors closed and locked. Engines off. I could hear people talking in the other cars. Someone said there'd been a natural gas leak from the geological event and that combustible engines could spark an explosion. Others were talking about a terrorist attack. There were no answers, and the officers weren't eager to talk. After about an hour, things were getting ugly. People were hungry, thirsty, and restless. One officer stepped up on the front cars, handing out water bottles, crackers, and processed cheese slices. He had to step from one car to another, denting the hoods with his steel-tipped shoes. 
They were also handing out thick black plastic hygiene bags for people who needed to relieve themselves. Use them, seal them, drop them out the door. Then lock up and wait. I'd crawled into the back seat, pulled down my cap and tried to relax. I'd been playing some games on my phone, but the battery was running low. I wanted to save some, so I settled for having a nap instead. The sweat was stinging my eyes. Not because of how warm it was, but because of how nervous I was. No matter what I did, I felt trapped, and the car felt smaller and smaller. I couldn't get out if I wanted to, and it physically hurt me to think about how little control I had. Is that what claustrophobia feels like? A couple of officers were discussing something by the front line. One of them had a white cotton glove on, which he used to wipe off the hood of one of the front cars. The glove was taken off and put into a bag, which in turn was sealed with a hot air gun. I was getting the impression that our cars had been covered in something. I wasn't the only one considering it. There were two college kids in the car to my left, and they were discussing it too. Anthrax, one of them said. Gotta be. Nah, gold dust, the other chuckled. They don't want to share. You know what? The first groaned. I honest to God hope you're right. You're not, but I hope you are. Fuck you. I joined in the conversation shortly after. I offered another explanation, something combustible, something that might blow up if we started our cars. They were willing to consider this. The car behind me couldn't hear us, but the driver held up a notebook with the text. If we do no woot, it's go to be aliens. I couldn't tell if they were serious, but they weren't laughing about it. A man in his fifties, and what looked like his daughter. There were a couple of other folks in the other cars. A man in a black shirt, sort of looked like a preacher without a collar. Two middle-aged women with a kid in the back seat. A fat man blaring Johnny Cash from his stereo. A couple with a teenage son who couldn't stop drumming on the windows. We'd been stuck for about two, maybe two and a half hours, when a truck rolled in. One of those with a large water tank. It was unmarked, looked civilian. As it rolled in, they were calling out on the megaphone. We'll be hosing your vehicles down, they said. Keep everything locked and closed. Then we'll be covering your vehicle with protective plastic while we wait for it to dry. After that, we'll start letting you go in an orderly manner. I repeat, most of us were relieved. It was only a matter of time now. It was getting dark. They were getting up on the cars, hosing them down thoroughly. It smelled of chlorine, so maybe they'd mix something into the water. As they came to my car, they stepped up on it and double-checked the sunroof, making sure it was locked and secured. They sprayed the car down, bathing it in chemical stink, the kind that gets stuck to the back of your throat. It took a long time for them to finish, at least an hour or two. After that, they were rolling out a kind of plastic cover at the short side of the lot, the kind you use to protect pools or rain covers for football fields. They used two squad cars to slowly drape the thing over the entire lot, securing the edges with large rocks. Please stay calm, they called out as the plastic crawled over us. I know this is uncomfortable, but this is for your own safety. Once the cleaning is done, you will be free to go. Stay inside your vehicle at all times, I repeat. I did as I was told. I stayed inside, and I watched that plastic cover sweep over me. It felt like getting buried alive. All lights went out leaving me in complete darkness, accompanied only by the vague, disembodied voices of the others. The college kids were talking about where they were going to go after this. Someone was honking, not sure if it was to show support or discontent. Someone else was cheering. I took my last swig of water, washing down my final plane cracker. I got back in the driver's seat, I could hear as they finished moving the plastic cover and parking their squad vehicles. I waited patiently, figuring it'd be maybe another hour or so. 
They hadn't really given us a timeline, but I could breathe a little easier. Sort of. I was going back and forth between feeling empowered with my hands on the wheel and feeling like I was stuck in a metal coffin. It was so dark, and everything smelt of plastic and chemicals. Like a car wash stuck in time. As the excitement died down, I paid more attention to the background sounds. I tried to filter out the various discussions from the nearby cars, and somewhere in the distance I heard raised voices. It wasn't coming from the cars, but the officers. Whatever they were talking about, it was a heated discussion. An hour came and went, and people were getting impatient. More cars were honking. Others were yelling, demanding answers. I couldn't get my leg to stop shaking. The more I thought about getting out of there, the smaller the car felt. I was hyper-focusing on things I couldn't control. I was a little thirsty and I was out of water. I needed to use the bathroom. I wanted to stretch my legs and go for a walk. I wanted to breathe fresh air and get that awful chemical taste out of my mouth. I heard cars starting, accelerating. The truck was moving somewhere off to the side. We need you to stay in your vehicle, a voice screamed over the megaphone. Do not leave for any reason. Stay in your vehicle. Cars speeding off. Not many, but a couple. Then, quiet. The officers left us there. Everyone was quiet. A couple of folks had opened up their phones, using them as flashlights to look from car to car. Looking out at the sea of vehicles, all of us trapped under that dark cover, I could see a handful of lights cut off by sharp silhouettes. I couldn't make out who was who in the dark. It was all just people. Anonymous. I heard a gasp somewhere in the back. There was a metallic clunk, like when the officers climbed atop our cars to get us our water. There was a careful cheer as some folks figured they were taking off the plastic cover. But that wasn't it. Instead, there were more footsteps. The cheers slowly died down as more and more footsteps pattered across our cars. I stopped counting after a dozen. The silhouettes in the other cars were still. We all held our breaths, waiting for an answer to show itself. What the hell was going on? What was that sound? Somewhere off to my right I heard a voice. Who's up there? It sounded like an older man. I'd seen a pickup truck that way earlier. Almost as a response, the footsteps stopped. There was a faint clicking sound, like someone snapping their tongue against the roof of their mouth. Click, click. And from further away, a click in response. From somewhere to my left, another couple clicks. Then, a cascade of clicks. Dozens. Maybe hundreds. There was an awful metallic noise coming from my right. Then, breaking glass. A scream cut short, followed by several irregular taps of the car horn. One of the silhouettes in the distance turned into a blur as something passed through the windshield, cutting through the plastic cover. Somewhere in the front row, the roof of a car was cut wide open. Someone was pulled up out of their seat. Two cars back from where I was, there was more glass breaking. It sounded like a wild animal got in. I could see a weak hint of red spattered against the passenger side windows. I wasn't getting any air. I could feel my heart beating through my chest as my arms started shaking. My hands were cramped around the steering wheel and I felt sweat dripping down my shoulders. I couldn't control it. I didn't even see what was going on, but these sounds, these screams, they awakened something primal. This was danger, a threat. My body knew long before I did. The college kids in the other car were ducking down. One of them waved a hand at me as if telling me to get down. I nodded. I scrambled into the back seat. I couldn't see where I was putting my hands or my feet. Everything is different in the dark. As I tumbled my way over, my foot accidentally tapped the car horn. It was a quick tap, a fraction of a second. But to me, it was the loudest sound in the world. I was lying on my stomach in the back seat, 
and within seconds, something heavy climbed onto the hood of my car. I could feel the car buckling. It was much heavier than the man who'd passed out water bottles. I held my hands in front of my mouth to stop the panting, but I just ended up snorting up sweat instead. My nose stung as I bit my tongue, listening to every metallic groan as whatever was outside moved and shifted. Click, click. And from behind my car, a click in response. There were no lights being held up anymore. Everyone was cowering, going quiet. I pushed myself up against the door behind the driver's seat, trying to make myself as small as possible. I could hear the frame of the car complain as something slowly moved. When it came to my sunroof, there was a slight crack. That made it stop. Another crack. I silently shook my head, as if trying to ask the car to stop. That thing was going to break. And it did. My legs were showered with glass as a big blob of plastic cover dipped into my car. Something big came tumbling into the front seat, still covered in protective plastic. It twitched and spun around, its clicking turning from a careful question-like noise to a never-ending barrage. It was calling for help, alerting others, and it was cutting its way through the plastic. There were footsteps coming from every direction some of them leaping from car to car, some of them leaping far enough to skip a car as they hurried. I was going to be swarmed within seconds. I fumbled with my hands, accidentally cutting my thumb on the broken glass. I managed to open the passenger side door, but even at its widest, and even when pressing into the college kid's car, it wasn't enough room to get out. Still, I had to try. I pressed myself into the gap and exhaled as much as I could, flattening my chest. While the thing thrashed around inside my car, I could feel my vision going faint. Black spots popped up at the edge of my vision. My arms were going weak. And yet by some miracle, I made it through. As my face hit the gravel of the makeshift parking lot, I felt the burn of residual chemicals. I swallowed my instinct to run, instead staying on my stomach, forcing myself to crawl under my car. There were more of them. Some climbing on, some off. My chest was pressed to the ground as the weight shifted. I heard breaking glass from the windshield and tearing fabric. Something was stuck up there, and it was furious like a trapped animal. I could hear the college kids mumbling to one another, trying to stay calm one assuring the other that all they had to do was stay low, stay quiet, and wait. Then something slammed into the passenger side door, the one I'd crawled out of. The door was pressed up against the neighboring car, then fell haphazardly to the ground, completely off the hinges. An ink-black, bird-like foot touched the ground right next to me. I've looked it up since. There were three toes forward, one toe backward, all clawed. Anisodactyl feet, similar to that of many birds of prey, except larger than a human foot and with smooth, oil-slick skin. It must have been heavy, at least four hundred pounds. If the clicking noise came from its mouth, I can approximate that it was somewhere around six-seven to six-nine. Or taller, it could have been hunched over. How it managed to walk in the gap between the vehicles is beyond me, but I suspect it was very thin. It daintily walked from my car to the others, as if scanning for something. I could barely see anything in the dark, but this thing seemed to navigate it perfectly. It didn't bump into anything. There was a tap on the glass of the car behind me to my right, and someone got startled. A short scream, and the hunt was on. This time was different. It must have caused some kind of chain reaction, as all of a sudden the plastic cover was getting torn up left and right. People were clawing their way out of their cars. I heard someone kicking against their windshield. Another was trying to open their door. I could hear it slamming against the side of the car next to them. And off in the distance there was gunfire. Just a couple of shots. The college kids in the car next to me slammed their doors open and followed my lead. They rolled onto the ground and under their car. There was a little more light coming in as the cover had been torn above. 
Their faces were red from tears, and one of them was desperately trying to call for help on his phone. The other grabbed the phone out of his hand. A short scuffle ensued, ending with them putting on a ringtone and sliding the thing as far to the left as they could. Whatever car that phone landed under was demolished. Every window broken. Every passenger. Gone. I could hear the grinding as a seat was ripped in two and thrown away. In a matter of seconds, an entire vehicle was torn to pieces as a dozen of those things swarmed it. Shut up! One of the college kids repeated. Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! Something reached under my car. It scraped against the sole of my shoe, tearing a hole all the way to my big toe. I hurried forward, scurrying like a lizard. The college kids noticed and followed suit. Meant, I don't think they thought about it too much. It was just movement, and they went for it. I made it two cars down before I got stuck. There was something dark in the way, and I couldn't get around it without exposing myself. I couldn't see what it was, but it didn't take long for me to figure it out. There was a meaty crunch, as if someone was biting chunks out a piece of meat. It was struggling to get through the fabric of their clothes, making a snapping noise as threads gave way. A pool of blood rolled under the car, staining the tip of my fingers. It was still warm. One of those things were eating a victim. I hunkered down, trying to remember to breathe. And I stayed there, waiting for a chance. Any chance. I must have stayed there for at least an hour, hearing every bite. Every crack of bone and snap of sinew. Satisfied clicking noises. As it finished its meal, it wandered off, dragging the remains along. They were moving forward. Something heavy walked over the car I was hiding under, dragging a body along. Slowly, the footsteps disappeared. It was quiet again, and in that quiet, I found my footing. I made my way to the edge of the plastic cover. I listened one final time, pushed one of the weights away, and slipped through. They were gone, and I was out. I could feel my chest growing lighter, allowing me to breathe. I wanted to cry from relief. A breeze was picking up, drying the sweat on my brow and carrying the smell of grass. Stepping back, I turned towards the sea of cars to see how bad the damage was. And then I saw one. It was a bit off to the side, perching on top of an old Honda. At a glance, it looked like a tall person, covered in a slick black ink. But looking closer, you could see the strange bird-like feet, the pointed nails, the long row of shark-like teeth on a mouth that was far too wide. I froze. The thing rose to its full length, easily over seven feet tall. It looked ready to pounce on me. I had nothing to defend myself with. I couldn't make any sudden moves. I wouldn't even be halfway under the car before that thing would be over me. A hundred thoughts raced through my mind, but there was nothing I could do. I was out of options. But the thing just looked at me. It raised a slice of raw meat. Blood dripped onto the plastic cover. It looked at me curiously, taking a bite. Then, as if nothing had happened, it wandered off, satiated. I was left there, shaking like a dry leaf. And with the last of those things gone, all that was left was the panic. It didn't take long for the officers to return. The plastic cover was removed. But we couldn't go home. Not after this. Some folks signed a waiver and were let go immediately. They weren't allowed to talk about what they'd seen, and in return they'd get a hefty sum of insurance money. Others demanded answers and were taken into custody for obstruction of justice. A few others still were too panicked to make any kind of sense and had to be checked out by medical personnel. A total of 14 people died. It was described by a combination of causes. A traffic pileup. Carbon monoxide poisoning. Animal attack. I think there was something about an escaped convict, too. Excuses all over the place, and the times were all wrong, spread out through a couple of days to more smoothly blend into accident statistics. 
and if you wanted to go home and get your insurance money, you had to sign a non-disclosure. I did too. I know the college kids did as well. Goddamn miracle they made it out, but I saw them. Thirty-four cars had to be towed. Eighteen people wounded, six seriously so. Four people lost at least one limb. One guy had an arm ripped off halfway up his collarbone. I don't know how he survived. Most people never saw those things up close. They just remember the screams and the breaking glass. Sometimes, at night, that's all I hear too. Closing my eyes reminds me of lying under those cars, feeling the pressure as the weight shifted. I still get trouble breathing. I think a part of me is still stuck there. It stayed in my vehicle.